Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to grieve and mourn the loss of the one, the only, Nicole Rudolph. I'm not dead yet. Okay, but if I need this to work, I need you to be dead. Okay. So I need you to just... <clears throat> no, where was I? Oh yes. Underneath your seats, per our Anglo-American, Georgian and Victorian funerary traditions, you will find one gift basket. And in this gift basket, you will find only the most historically accurate Victorian and Georgian funeral gifts. One pair of white leather gloves, a mourning ring, but only for Nicole's closest personal friends and family. After all, she's not entirely made of money, guys. She can't give everyone a mourning ring, you know what I mean? Like, it's only like for like her special friends. You will definitely find your customary two funeral biscuits. And so with that, in the words of the incredible Oprah Winfrey, you get a gift basket and you get a gift basket. Everybody gets a funeral gift basket. Ow, 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 ow. Do I get a gift basket? Only if you play dead better. Good job. You can shut your eyes. And so with that, my friends, sit back and relax and let me tell you about the very obscure custom of giving gifts at funerals. Part one, gloves. So yeah, you heard me correctly, gloves. I know this sounds strange and it's weird to me. In fact, the gloves are literally why I wanted to do this video. Like I, I wanted to learn more about them, but they were actually one of the most common gifts handed out at funerals. While I'm not 100% sure when the custom of giving gloves began, I can say that it definitely was a thing by the end of the 1600s and blew up in popularity throughout the 1700s. And then it slowly started to dwindle down in the 1800s. Now I'm sure a lot of you all are sitting there right now watching me going, Gloves, Abby? Like, why gloves? And I'm, I'm, Welcome to the club. That's all I have to say to you. It's actually a point of confusion for modern scholars who research this topic as to why gloves. Now we can look at it from a logical perspective of, okay, well, gloves were it's a display of wealth. It's a display of gentility. It's also a way to build community. It's a way to maintain and build relationships by giving these sorts of gifts. But as for like a spiritual reason, as far as I'm aware from the research that I've read and from other scholars who research this topic, there's no solid like spiritual reason as to why. So it's left historians at a bit of a loss. Now, with that being said, this lack of understanding as to why, and also just kind of the obscurity of glove giving itself in funerals has at least spared us from completely asinine hot takes here on YouTube and TikTok where people are like just making stuff up. Uh, so back in the 19th century, uh, in the 1700s, <laughs> God, I can't believe I just said that. People would give out gloves at funerals because people didn't have toilet paper. And so the gloves were given out so that way people would have a way to wipe their bum after they went to the toilet. And so because people died all the time, you would always be able to get a fresh pair of gloves like every month. So that way you could always wipe your butt. And then that way when your gloves just got all covered with poopy, you could just get a new pair of gloves the next time someone died. That's something completely stupid like that. And by the way, if that shows up on TikTok, one, thank you for watching. Two, I hate you. That was a joke. I literally just made that up for this video. It's not real. <laughs> With all that being said, gloves were so commonplace that you see them all the time being referenced. Information about funerals and deaths and wills. My personal favorite is from this 1769 newspaper article of a wealthy woman who lost her dog. Quote, Monday last, a lady of fortune at the west end of the town had her favorite lap dog named Diamond interred with great funeral pomp. His coffin was covered with black cloth ornamented with white nails, handles, and a plate upon the coffin on which was engraved his age and pedigree. Her servants that attended the funeral had white gloves and favors given them upon the unhappy occasion. God, I love this. I love this so much because as a like certified dog mom, like this lady like mourning the loss of her dog and actually giving him like a proper funeral is just deeply relatable. I get it. But also this dog was named Diamond. I cannot help but assume that he was also a terrorist. Did the servants actually miss the dog or were they just sitting there going, oh thank God, that dog is dead. He was awful but at least we're getting free gloves for showing up, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but the fact that this woman threw this <laughs> funeral for her dog, and we have all these great details about how nice the coffin was, what the coffin looks like, but also that she specifically gave out gloves, it just goes to really reinforce the social custom and expectation and popularity of glove giving at funerals. You show up to a funeral, you're expected to get a pair of gloves. 
Hey guys, just popping in here real quick to talk to you all about the sponsor of this week's video, Brooklinen. Now, Brooklinen is a luxury sheet company that creates high quality home goods. And it being fall and the holiday season, it is the perfect time of year for a bedding refresh. Now, Jimmy and I, love, we love the Luxatine sheets that Brooklyn makes and we use them all year except for in the summer where we're using the linen sheets because obviously when it's really hot, having linen sheets is just superior. They come in over 20 different colors and patterns plus seasonal designs that always sell out super quickly. So you can totally mix and match and build up just tons of different color and design options to suit your preference and your tastes. With over 100,000 five-star reviews, you know that Brooklyn makes some incredible bedding. And so if you would like to give Brooklyn in a try, now is honestly the best time because it's the Black Friday sale. And this is the biggest sale of the year for Brooklyn. In. They have 20% off everything online. Plus, if you order the bedding bundles, like the Lux Hardcore bedding bundle, which is what Jimmy and I get, you get an additional discount on top of that 20%. So honest to God, guys, it is just the best time to buy some sheets. You know what I mean? Go ahead and use the link in my description below to go ahead and get some excellent holiday shopping done, whether it's for you or someone you love, because we all do love a good practical gift. Huge thank you to Brooklyn and for sponsoring this video. And again, guys, go ahead and use that link in the description below to do some shopping. And with that, let's get back to morbid things. Okay, so the next question is, is what do these gloves look like? Well, I think it's easy to assume that they would be black because you know, black is morning and da, 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 da. All evidence actually points to them being extremely straightforward. They are white, plain leather gloves. And this makes sense because we needed to have these gloves essentially readily available in a large quantity very, very quickly. In fact, they could even send out their apprentices to hand out the gloves at funerals directly. Though sometimes it didn't always go well for the apprentice. Last Friday, I sent it about nine o'clock at night. An apprentice of Mr. Raymond Glover in Worcester, who was returning on horseback from Poick, where he had been to serve some gloves at a funeral. He was met about a mile from the city by a highwayman well-mounted who clapped a pistol to his breast and robbed him of about four 14 shillings. Male apprentices at this point in time, they were usually in their teenage years. So this kid was honestly anywhere between 14 to 18 years old. And I have a sneaky suspicion that that 14 shillings either would as payment for the gloves themselves or possibly payment and a tip for him. I feel really bad for the kid. <laughs> Could you imagine being like, like a 15 year old kid, like at this funeral handing out gloves and like everyone's like sad, but then like people are starting to drink and you're like, I just want to go home. I'm so uncomfortable right now. And then you get robbed by a hire. You're like, man, I'm just doing my job. I feel really bad for the kid. I, that would have just been terrible. Now for what these gloves look like specifically, we do have a pair that survives in the Connecticut Historical Society that have direct provenance to a funeral. Weirdly, an identical pair can be found at the Met, but these are marked as riding gloves. Now, what does that tell us? I think it alludes to the fact that these gloves didn't really have strong symbolic markers on them per se. Um, we do have some gloves that survive in collections that are inked and they're white ground with like black stamps on them. Sometimes they'll have emblems like on the top of the hand that can kind of look like maybe it has something to do with the funeral. But if we think about like the ready-made-ness of them and the quick delivery of them and how like we needed to have a lot of them for a funeral, the simplicity makes a lot of sense. I think we probably just had like basic white gloves for women, basic white gloves for men. Is this pair in the Met that are marked as riding gloves, funeral gloves? I don't know. It could be, or they could be both. Like maybe you just the gloves that you got at funerals could also double as riding gloves. But this also might be why so many don't survive. There's no way for us to tell that they're specifically funeral gloves. All we see are just plain white leather gloves. That pair in the Met could be from a funeral. We generally just have no way of knowing. And the only way we know that the Connecticut pair is with the funerals because someone literally made a note saying so from the period. But what we do know is that they were white and they were leather. From July 5th, 1722. On Thursday night last was buried in Bunhill Field Mr. Jacobs, a preacher much talked of in this city. He was commonly called Whisker Jacobs because himself and the men of his congregation were distinguished by wearing mustachios. As he was singular in his life, so was he at his death. Having given orders, the company should have rings and white gloves at his funeral, but no scarfs nor hat bands. I love that his entire congregation of like the men in his congregation all wore mustaches. Like for the 18th century, that's actually really uncommon. Like facial hair was not a thing in the 18th century. Um, so that's a vibe, but it also is very much a culty vibe. And I think that's hilarious. 
But the one thing about glove giving is that it is absolutely a signifier of gentility and a certain social status. You had to be able to afford to give these gloves and they were not extremely inexpensive. They actually could cost quite a bit of money. And so to be able to give gloves at your funeral, especially to every attendee at the funeral and not just like a select few of people, that was a huge signifier of wealth and status. And this occurred in the colonies as well as it did in Great Britain. In Stephen Bullock and Sheila McIntyre's article, The Handsome Tokens of a Funeral, Glove Giving and the Large Funeral in 18th Century New England, Boston minister Benjamin Coleman sent his late daughter's husband 144 pairs of gloves to give out to her funeral. And while Coleman was considered upper class for Boston society at that point in time in history, Bullock notes that glove giving was also common for middling classes too in Bostonian and New England society. Hey guys, okay, just popping in here really, really fast with some additional information because the follow-up letter to the one that you just saw actually includes some great info about how these gloves were passed out, which tells us information on etiquette and social decorum and manners, especially in funerals in the 18th century. So this is what it says. I forgot to add last night that you must take your gloves as they come versus when you have opened a dozen year through it. This part's a little bit, but let none come to try on except a particular person, nor let them draw on and then take another change for none except your bearer. So what he's saying here is don't let people come early and try on gloves to find a pair that fit. Don't let people stand in line and try on gloves until they find a pair that fit because that'll ruin them. Don't let them put them on and then like fuss with them and then grab another pair. Have them take a pair and go. The only exception to this are the pallbearers, which makes total sense. You want their gloves to fit. Whether the gloves fit or no, people People must take them. We always do so at Boston. And so this is just a great example of, again, it's not a spiritual thing. It's not a religious thing. It is a social etiquette display of status, wealth, class, etc. No, you take your gloves and you go. Thanks for coming. I would say have a great day, but we're at a funeral. So it's kind of probably a shitty day, let's be honest, but just take your gloves. I know you're here for them and just get out the door, please. Like we don't have time for you to fuss and try to find a pair that fits. Now, the other thing of note about this letter is how he notes how much those gloves cost. Six shillings a pair in the 1730s. That's not cheap. This brings up then the broader issue of cost of funerals, which we're gonna continuously touch on throughout the rest of this video, and the critique of funerals, and the critique of the expense of mourning that happens throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. Like you can't have one without the other. In Josiah Woodward's 1712 book, Fair Warnings to a Careless World, or the Serious Practice of Religion Recommended by the Admonitions of Dying Men, he actually blasts, like just completely blasts, the custom of giving rings, gloves, and other presents at funerals, promoting a much more logical gift-giving idea of books. Quote, the truth contained in such a book, so bequeathed and given us by a deceased friend or his surviving relations, will probably make a more lasting impression than a sermon itself, much more than a death's head on a ring. You know, I mean, like, I get what he's saying, but I also can only imagine a dad with his family, you know, and he's like trying to be serious and like make sure like everyone's good. And he's like reading this book and he's like, family, I don't think that we should hand out gloves at your aunt's funeral or whatever. And like the girl comes like running in and she's like, Papa, no, we absolutely must give gloves. Everybody who's anybody gives gloves. And if we don't give gloves at the funeral, we'll be the laughing stock of London society. Oh, I've had ever so many gloves at funerals. It'll be social suicide if we don't. No. They seem to fade out by the end of the 19th century, you don't see them nearly as often after the 18th century. Part two, funeral and mourning rings. Unlike gloves, which are a bit of a mystery and kind of hard to research, mourning rings are extremely popular. You see them all the time on the internet. There are people making reproductions. You can buy antique ones online. Like mourning rings have been around for a very, very long time, but they did blow up in popularity in the 18th century. Now, according to Christian Holm, who wrote the article, Sentimental Cuts, 18th century mourning jewelry and hair, the reason behind this, she states, is because of the increased commercialization of mourning jewelry and mourning customs within the 
the 18th century. So capitalism, baby. That where in the 17th century and previous centuries, morning jewelry was reserved for only the upper class who could afford it, because of the cheapening costs of creating morning jewelry, it became more readily available to a wider range of social classes. So the value within the morning ring itself kind of shifted, where in the 17th century, it was not only a sign of grief and loss, but also a sign of wealth and status. In the 18th century, it mostly just symbolized your connection to the person you lost and that sentimental value and that emotional impact. Now, as for how the rings looked, this is actually really easy because one, tons of them survive. You can buy them on eBay, Etsy, through antique jewelers. There's a lot of different types of morning rings. They were so common in the 18th century that you find tons and tons of them in the newspapers, especially in lost and stolen ads. And so with that, we know that they're usually gold. There's usually enameling involved, most commonly black, but there are references to white. Quote, one black enameled morning ring with the name and branding on it or braiding one white enamel morning ring with the name james on it i'm not i cannot read that from back here so we will not be reading that they could also have stones in them diamonds they could have the person's hair in them as well stolen this afternoon quote a large black morning ring with hair under a crystal inscribed on the outside martha very december 22nd 1770 and on the inside zipporah stone March 20th, 1771. Just to kind of take a quick side <laughs> side tangent here about hair. While we might find hair and the use of hair and jewelry a little bit gross, um, a little bit weird in society pre-photography, it actually makes a lot of sense because portraiture and a visual memory of a person was really only available to the upper classes who could afford to have a portrait painted of a family member. And so for the vast majority of people, they didn't have a visual reminder of a person. And so the exchange of hair is is a very permanent way to remember someone because it's one of the few things on the human body that does not decompose or rot. And so the act of cutting a lock of hair and giving it to someone not only is quite the intimate gesture and was used for a token of love as well as friendship, but also to mark the loss of someone and to hold as a memory. That it's literally something that carries their essence. It is that was a part of what they looked like and it's a physical reminder of who they are. Now, while hair jewelry blows up in the 19th century and it's just kind of like its own art form and it is a video that I wanna to get to and I wanna talk about the history of hair jewelry. I will get to it, I swear. It's on my list of things to do, but it's not the place for it here. Like gloves, morning rings were actually provided for in people's wills. It was not something that families were necessarily expected to pay for. Again, there's always the exception to that rule. If the person who died did not have a will left behind or could not afford morning rings, it could be the family provided morning rings for their closest friends as well as family members. It just depends. But we do know that people did leave behind money for morning rings in their wills and testament. One of my favorite references that I found when researching this was in a 1795 article about William Innes Esquire. He was the father of Blackheath Golf Club and to each of the gentlemen of that society, he bequeathed a morning ring. And I just love this idea. This is like my total headcanon guys, that like, the morning rings for the members of his golf club was literally like a skeleton holding the golf club. Do I have any actual historical evidence of this happening? No. Is it my headcanon? Do I find it hilarious? Absolutely. In my mind, that's what those rings look like. Like a little skeleton holding the golf club with like one of those little tams with the puffballs on him and he's like, Sorry, you're dead. <laughs> I think what's important to note though, ultimately with the rings is that while gloves were handed out to everyone or they could be handed out to everyone, rings were usually reserved for the closest of friends and family members, barring the exception of people who just had a lot of money and just like everyone gets a ring. <laughs> Part three, cookies. <laughs> Finally. My last gift to hand out in this morbid little gift bag of funeral gifts is the funeral biscuit or cookies for those of us, you know, who aren't British. There's already been a few videos about funeral biscuits. Max Miller did one where he gave a nice little history of sin eating as well as funeral biscuits. And then he made a gingerbread cookie to go with it. If you haven't watched that video, like I'll put a link in the description below, but I can't help but assume that if you're watching my channel, you probably also watch Max's channel. So for this little section, I want to dig a little deeper into the funeral biscuit. So the tradition of like funeral biscuits is 
is ancient. It dates back to at least the medieval period, probably well before the medieval period, and it is rooted in pagan customs. From an 1893 Folklore Society journal article about funeral biscuits, we have this delicious little nugget. The minister who had lately come from Pembrokeshire remarked to my informant that he was sorry to see that pagan customs still observed. He had been able to put it into it in the Pembrokeshire village where he had formerly been. Party pooper. Every party has a poop, but that's how we invited you. So this is kind of where I think the tradition of sin eating and funeral biscuits overlap. In the early days of funeral biscuits, so I'm talking, you know, 18th century and earlier, the funeral biscuits were served with a wine or a spirit or an ale, some sort of liquor to be consumed near the body. It kind of took on the role of sin eating, which if you're not familiar with that tradition, it seems to be Welsh in its origins. I have not asked Welsh Viking for proof of this. I apologize, Jimmy, if I am incorrect, I'm just reading off of this fairly old magazine article here. At funerals in some parts of Wales, there is a curious custom. A poor person is hired, a long, lean, ugly, lamentable rascal to perform the duties of sin eater. Bread and beer are passed to the man over the corpse or laid on it. These he consumes, and by the process he is supposed to take on him all the sins of the deceased and free the person from walking after death. When a sin eater is not employed, glasses of wine and funeral biscuits are given to each bearer across the coffin. The people believe that every drop of wine drunk at a funeral is a sin committed by the deceased, but that by drinking the wine, the soul of the dead is released from the burden of the sin. So unlike the rings and the gloves, funeral biscuits actually do have a spiritual or a sort of religious significance within the process of having and holding a funeral. The other thing about funeral biscuits is unlike gloves and rings, which were more middling to upper class traditions, funeral biscuits were all social classes, from upper down to lower classes. Everyone participated in funeral biscuits in the 18th and 19th century. Quote, and it is, it seems, the custom at funerals of the middling and lower class of people to provide a kind of sugared biscuit, which are wrapped up generally two of them together in a sheet of white paper sealed with black wax and thus presented to each person attending the funeral. Over time, this tradition of handing the biscuit over the coffin with the wine in hand fades away and they just kind of sort of become like party favors to go. According to Jacqueline Thursby in her book, Funeral Festivals in America, Rituals for the Living, she states, in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, a prevailing funeral custom was that a young man and a young woman would stand on either side of a path that led from the church house to the cemetery. The young woman held a tray of funeral biscuits and sweet cakes. The young man carried a tray of spirits and a cup. As mourners passed by, they received a sweet from the maiden and a sip of spirits from the cup. And then later, in that at the end of the 19th century, at the end of the late 1800s, these funeral biscuits honestly just are something that people take home. And usually they're just given to their children after the fact. Quote, I have already referred to what was called the funeral biscuit, which was seldom eaten by such of the male mourners as had young folks at home. My grandfather, who resided in a small borough in Renfrewshire, always had one or two of his grandchildren awaiting his return from any burial he attended, who were not often disappointed in seeing the coveted morsel produced from his pocket and having it shared among them. In an 1897 article about funeral biscuits, we learn a little bit about what they look like and also how American culture and British culture shifted in the 19th century. And along this whole like party favor vibe, if you were someone who wasn't able to attend a funeral that you were invited to, people would actually mail you these funeral biscuits like in the, in the mail. In Yorkshire, when prevented from attending a funeral to which an invitation had been given, a memorial card is received with several lady fingers folded in the black edged paper and fastened with black seals. So this is a really great example of something that at one point had a strong spiritual significance to it becoming just like a social custom party favor that you would literally just like mail off to someone who wasn't able to attend the funeral. But it's a really great example of just how this practice evolved. Now the tradition of funeral biscuits does seem to sort of fade away around World War II. And frankly, this makes sense due to rationing. This actually brings me to what these cookies actually look like. And this is a point of great debate and I am going to kind of go on a tangent. So buckle up buttercups, we're getting, we're getting sassy. There's been a lot of confusion here and a lot of it comes down to what Americans have interpreted in the colonial history and trying to understand American colonial history versus what actually survives in primary source documentation. In Thursby's book, she states that in the American colonies that funeral biscuits were a sort of molasses cookie. Her statement 
in this book is based off another secondary source and she has no primary evidence given to back up this claim. And then on top of that, when you go to the internet and you just type in like funeral biscuit, you see this sort of continuous repetition of this idea that the funeral biscuit could be any sort of cookie or any sort of flavor. And then they always tie it to a gingerbread or a molasses cookie, but there's no actual primary source evidence given. And this drives me bonkers. While there are always exceptions to the rule, always exceptions to rules. And maybe the colonies might have had this a slightly modified tradition. I don't know due to supplies. I don't think so. I have a, I have my own theory behind this. I'm having a really hard time finding any sort of actual meaningful connection between a spiced cake or biscuit or cookie, whether it's ginger or molasses to funerals. The only thing I was able to find from a primary source is from an 1898 English dialect dictionary book about Avril bread, which is another way to say basically a funeral biscuit. Avril bread, funeral loaves, spiced with cinnamon, nutmeg, sugar, and raisins. But I wanna make this clear. That's talking about bread. It's not talking about a biscuit or a cookie. Did it have ginger or molasses mentioned? No, it didn't. Also, it is a bread, it is a loaf, which was also a part of this custom as well. They, The biscuits and the loaves were not fully interchangeable, but there was definitely some overlap, okay? So this is where I'm at. If you, have a primary source reference for a ginger or a molasses cookie being used for funeral biscuits, especially in, in the United States, in early American colonies, please share it with me. I would love to see it because right now, all I'm seeing is an abuse of secondary and tertiary sources creating a circle jerk of misinformation. And I don't like that. That upsets me as a historian <laughs> because there is actual primary source evidence as to what these funeral biscuits look like. They are always described as a sort of lady finger or finger biscuit. In fact, we have exact measurements. <laughs> Funeral biscuits with wine are commonly provided in Leicestershire as a refreshment for the mourners before leaving the house on the day of a funeral. They are similar to those described by O, excepting in shape, being flat finger biscuits about four inches long and one inch broad from 1876 Notes and Queries. Furthermore, there is an 1828 cookbook that literally has a recipe to make 50 funeral biscuits. And I took that recipe and I made it according to like, not just like the minimal instructions given, but just kind of my concept of like how to make cookies. Like I piped them out and they rose a little bit. They're not like hugely fancy, like lady fingers. They're actually really good. Um, I could see why Victorian kids would go like crazy for these. They actually get better once they cool off and kind of settle for a bit. I think it allows the sugar and like the caramelization of the sugar to kind of take hold, but they're not super heavy and they're really quite good. They have that between the egg and like the caramelized sugar, they have a nice kind of like like almost almondy flavor to them, but there's no almond extract in them. And this really minimal recipe makes sense too, because confectionery businesses had to be able to bust out a lot of cookies very, very quickly on very short notice. It doesn't make sense that they would be spending time making like these elaborate cookies with stamps printed into them or, you know, using expensive spices or extracts. They kept it at the bare minimum. Now, I'm also not gonna say that there isn't a chance of there being slight regional variations because there are, like, of course there are. For example, there's a very funny quote from that 1882 Macmillan magazine, quote, orange peel was a new experience to him. When the tough substance got entangled in his teeth, he dislodged it and threw it away. Wondering with an expletive more forcible than reverential, what induced people to put ham rinds into their biscuits? So what was the expense of everything? In an 1850 book called Report to the General Health about the County of Durham, William Ranger states that funeral biscuits would cost about one shilling eight pence, which is really cheap. I mean, dirt cheap, especially when you compare it to the cost of morning clothing, morning fabrics, the coffin, funeral procession, scarves, hats, the alcohol, but even just the gloves as well, which one pair of gloves, according to him, could cost anywhere but from one shilling six pence, so literally the entire cost of the cookies up to three shillings a pair. Hey, okay, so popping in again, just to kind of remind you that the letter that we read earlier about gloves and the gloves costing six shillings a pair, that is also just another addition to this huge disparity when it comes to how expensive gloves could be. So just kind of keep that in mind. These things like weren't necessarily super cheap. Even the gifts could be extremely expensive. This brings me to the ultimate critique of all of these things, which we've kind of already touched on, which is that funerals and the practice of mourning is very expensive. And it has always been expensive. Both 
Pollock states in his article, often concerned in funerals, a ritual material culture and the large funeral in the age of Samuel Seawall, in a year when all of Boston paid 1,700 pounds to the province for poll and property taxes, the Winthrop's funeral ceremony cost almost 600 pounds. That's more than the tax payments from any other locality in the colony and more than twice as much of all of Maine put together. The gloves, the rings, the biscuits, not to mention the other expenses, the clothing, the fabric, the hat bands, the coffin, all of it was so much money. And it put a lot of pressure on lower social classes to try and keep up with the middling and upper classes who put on these great displays of wealth when it comes to funerals. So it's not a surprise that these practices brought a lot of criticism. In 1774, our Continental Congress actually legislated and restricted our expression of mourning and funeral practices as a way to control finances and on the death of any relation or friend, none of us or any of our families will go into any further mourning dress than a black crepe ribbon on the arm or hat for gentlemen and a black ribbon and necklace for ladies. And we will discontinue the giving of gloves and scarves at funerals. By the Continental Congress limiting and legislating our expression of mourning and dress, but also gift giving at funerals, it clearly indicates how these practices don't actually have spiritual value, but are just a reflection of that moment in time's social custom norms and expectations. Basically at that point, it was just sort of like a morbid version of a birthday party or a wedding favor today. If you show up to a funeral, you're just gonna get some gifts. It makes people more inclined to show up if I'm being honest. I would love to know what you all think is a funeral practice we should bring back. And out of the three gifts that I've told you about, which one was your favorite? And if you did enjoy this video, I hope that you give it a thumbs up. I really would appreciate it if you do. And if you have not subscribed to my channel yet, please do so. We love talking history here with primary sources and not shitty secondary sources. And don't forget to shop Brooklinen's Black Friday sale in the link in the description below. And with that, a huge thank you again to Brooklinen for sponsoring this video. Bye guys. Funeral gifts. Okay. Gotta do man stuff. Oh, I'm a man. I'm a man. I'm a serious man. Doing man stuff. This is Lewis. I got him from the Goodwill. Just pose like this. Oh no, Papa! We absolutely must mm. have gloves. Just covered up. How's that sound? Does that sound okay? Okay, cool. I think we're done here. <laughs> Molly was dead to begin with. Look it up!